Well, hello and welcome to Explorer Classroom. My name is Jennifer Bergen and I am so glad you are joining us today. At National Geographic, we know the power of exploration, wonder and storytelling can change the world. And this Explorer Classroom YouTube show connects students from all over the world with our National Geographic Explorers for short lessons and time for your questions. Today, our Explorer is Dr. Allison Crisatello. Allison is an ice core scientist and a high altitude mountaineer. This means that she studies ice core samples that she drills out of deep ice and can climb extremely high places. And some of the places where she has drilled ice for ice cores are Antarctica, Alaska, and the Canadian Arctic. Now, when Allison studies the ice cores, she looks to see what we can learn about our climate from long ago way back when the water was first frozen and turned into ice. But before we get into today's lesson, let's welcome our viewers who registered and are joining us from around the globe. We'd like to welcome some schools first, Hillard Elementary, IDEA Students, McKee Public School, Midcoast Munchkins, Miss Miles's class, Mr. Timmis, Miss San Shant's class, Miss B's class, Miss Noriega's class, Miss Vale's class, Niabsco Elementary, Odea Core Knowledge Elementary School, St. Clair, St. John's, T.A. Thompson Junior High, and Wayne Stewart Ryan Elementary. We've also got some registered families, the Andrews, Batistas, Corans, the Dinners, Dursts, Foxes, KOTRC, Larson, McCormick, Scott, Thibodeau, Vale, and Yana's families. We are so thrilled to have all of you here with us today. And with that, Let's get this Explorer classroom started. It's time to turn it over to Allison to share all about ice cores. Take it away, Allison. Thank you so much. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen so that you can see some photos. Well, thank you so much. Um, it's really awesome to be here to talk about my very favorite thing, the cold and wintertime and icy and frozen places on our planet. So how many of you have stood on ice, maybe where you live, maybe on a frozen river or a frozen lake? Raise your hand. Okay, so some of you have, but some of you have not actually stood on ice before. I am an identical twin, and my sister and I grew up loving to explore our snowy and icy backyard. Now, let me take you on a virtual trip to some glaciers and ice caps where we'll take some ice core samples together. Now, first of all, what is an ice core? An ice core is a cylinder of ice, like this one you can see here laid out on the snow in this picture um, that we drill out of a glacier or an ice sheet and it holds within it a record of climate. Now, this picture on the left is actually really, really cool. Um, so real, like large events that happen that impact the whole planet, such as a volcanic eruption, get preserved in ice, even at the poles in Antarctica and in the Arctic. And on the left, you can see that dark layer that's in the ice core. And this is an ice core from Antarctica. Um, and that dark layer was made by a large volcanic eruption hundreds of years ago. So snow gets laid down layer by layer, layer, preserving these events. Now this is what an ice core drill looks like. This particular drill can go over a thousand feet deep. And this photo was uh, this particular drill called the Eclipse in action last May uh, in the Yukon in Canada. A second kind of drill that I use a lot looks like this, and it can go about, about 75 feet deep. But the really cool thing about this one is that we can drill completely manually. So we can actually drill it down by hand, sort of screwing it with a handle and pull it up by hand, um, which is really important when we're looking at things like contaminants, where we, we don't wanna introduce new contaminants to the place that we're studying. Now I'm gonna show you a video next of what it looks like when we use this smaller drill by hand. Okay, so this is a sped up video of uh, me drilling there with two pals in the Canadian high Arctic. And 
You can see we're doing it manually. I'm not using a T-handle, I'm using a motor, but we drill down with, and we keep adding these pipes. Each one is a meter long, three feet long. And we add them and add them and add them um, until the core barrel is full and we pull it out. And now what we're doing is removing the core. You can see it laying down on the ground. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but it's the core is laying down on the ground in front of the person in the little snow pit. And then we send the drill back down the hole. We do the whole thing again. And every time we do this, we're recovering that meter or three feet of ice. So, so if we drill 30 feet of ice, we've done, we've done that 10 times. So that's, that's what it looks like. It's, it's a little bit tedious, but it's beautiful. And um, again, this is in the middle of a, of a smaller ice cap in the Canadian high Arctic. Now I thought I'd show you some images from some places where I currently work that show some amazing different forms and shapes that ice takes on our planet. This photo is from Mount Logan, Canada's highest mountain. I'm drilling an ice core high on Mount Logan next year in May, right near the summit. And this photo I took this past May um, when we were up there doing some work, sort of reconnaissance work for the drilling next year. And I like this project because it combines the two things that I really love, climbing and skiing, being in the outdoors um, and science. <laughs> so I have to climb to where I'm drilling this ice core and other ones that are very high because of the high altitude. And when we work at really high altitudes on mountains, we have to climb or ski up slowly to allow our bodies to acclimatize because there's less, less oxygen. And this past May, I was up there on Mount Logan doing this reconnaissance work for the drilling that I just talked about, which included a couple things. Um, one was installing a small weather station. And in the bottom left, you can see what that looks like. Um, at the very top of it, the, the thing with a tail that measures wind speed and direction. And then there's a bunch of other instruments on there that measure temperature, um, how much radiation, so how much so, um, solar input it's receiving. And um, this, this particular location is incredibly windy. So we will see if it even lasts till next May. Um, but it's bolted to bedrock. So yeah, the hopes are high. Um, the other stuff that we did this past May um, that you can see in the top left, we pulled around a radar system. Now, this is something that's really cool. It it's sort of like taking a photo through snow and it shows you all the layers of snow between your feet and the bedrock all the way below, which in this case is over a thousand feet, which is incredible because this is on the top of a mountain. Um, so it lets us pick the best ice core site because we can see where there's really beautiful layering in the snow and where we have the best chance of hitting the oldest ice. So we did this this past May too, up on Mount Logan. We installed this weather station and we did this big radar survey. Now, one last place that I wanted to show you today that I'm working right now is on the Columbia Ice Field, which is actually only a few hours um, from where I live in Edmonton, Alberta in Canada. And it's this beautiful snowy ice field that is the source of drinking water for many cities and towns downstream. Um, and that, so it's called a, a water tower because it's the source of drinking water. And here's some photos from this past spring um, where we were drilling ice cores up on Snow Dome, which is sort of this high, high, broad part of the ice field. Now the ice field is melting at alarming rates. And you can see here a melt layer in the ice core that I'm holding, which is unusual because usually we drill ice cores in pretty cold places. <laughs> Um, but this tells you right away, even just what you can see with your own eyes right here, that there's an incredible amount of melt happening in the middle of the summer. So the reason we're up there drilling cores is to look into what is starting to melt out of the ice that could potentially reach downstream drinking water and downstream ecosystems. My daughter, uh, her name is Winter, who was two this past spring, flew up to the Columbia ice field to visit me and to help me drill some ice cores. So it's never too early to start. Now, the very last thing that <clears throat> I know it's beautiful to look at photos from the field, but 
you know, what do we do with all this ice? Well, after we've drilled these ice cores in these beautiful places, we ship them back to the ice core lab. And that's really where the real work begins. We melt the ice and we start to see what secrets about past climate it holds. And these two last photos here are of the National Ice Core Lab here in Canada. Um, the, the, it's sort of two big rooms and the photo on the left is the cutting room where we cut up ice. We have these really cool imaging systems where we take these beautiful photos of the ice um, before we chop it up and melt it. So we always have this digital record of it. And then, and that room is uh, about minus 25. And then the right-hand photo shows the archive room, um, which sits at minus 40, the temperature at which Celsius and Fahrenheit cross. And it holds right now a kilometer and a half of ice, mostly from the Canadian high Arctic, but from, from all over the world. And um, so this is what, what our cold lab looks like here, but other countries that have ice core labs look very similar to this one. Um, so I just wanted to end with that because it's also important where the ice goes and, and what we start doing with it. Um, so that's what I wanted to show you. Thank you so much. Place to add to my vacation <laughs> list. Unless you need vacation. some help. Yeah, I'll work on my chainsaw skills. <laughs> well, friends, we're about out of time, but Allison, I'd like to ask on behalf of everyone, how can we join your mission and help protect Earth's ice? Well, I think that it's so important to remember that the little things that we do in our daily lives make a huge difference. And I remind myself of this all the time when I think about driving my car, but really I can bike or I can walk somewhere instead. And, and that's day to day, I think the thing to really remember that, that the, the decisions we make in our own lives make a huge difference for our planet, whether, whether it's that, you know, choosing to, to walk somewhere that you can instead of getting in a car or turning off lights in the rooms that you're not using. They seem little, but these things all add up and they make a huge difference. Um, yeah, we all, we all collectively can make a difference by doing these little things in our daily lives. Well, Allison, I will commit to doing those things. And viewers, I hope that you do as well. Like she said, if we all join together, we can make a pretty big difference. Well, Allison, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much. I really loved these questions. It was amazing. <laughs> also, thank you to all of our students and educators and family members who are joining us today. We're so glad to have you. And I hope that you'll come to our upcoming events. Next week, we're going to have explorer Eric Stackpole, who explores the ocean with robots. And then later this month, or actually next month, we're going to have Kinalo Molopayane and Kinalo explores bones. So lots of really cool shows coming down the schedule. You can register a student group for a shout out. You can even register your family. Just go to our website at natgeoed.org backslash explore classroom. Also to those of you celebrating, happy Hanukkah. We wish you a season of light, love and peace. Have a great day, everyone. Keep exploring, stay curious.